Welcome to the NASDAQ market site in New York City. We're here because the International Space Station is open for commercial business. Today we will discuss NASA's plan to open the space station to the U.S. private sector for commercial business. I'm Stephanie Scheerholtz of NASA Communications. Joining me to tell us about these exciting new opportunities are Jeff DeWitt, NASA's Chief Financial Officer, Robin Gatens, Deputy Director for the International Space Station at NASA Headquarters, Bill Gerstenmeier, Associate Administrator for the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters. In, addi in addition, we are joined here in the room by representatives from the Office of Space Commerce, the International Space Station U.S. National Laboratory, and 20 commercial companies. We'll begin with opening remarks from each of our panelists, then take questions from reporters. For those following online, you can ask questions using the hashtag AskNASA. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, today is a very remarkable day. NASA is opening the International Space Station to commercial opportunities and marketing these opportunities as we've never done before. Uh, we're announcing the ability for private astronauts to visit the space station on U.S. vehicles and for companies to engage in commercial profit-making activities on the station. This is all building off of our upcoming commercial crew vehicles transporting astronauts, uh, which will be used by both government and private citizen astronauts. This will open space to new companies to unleash American corporate innovation and ingenuity in new markets, all driving a lower cost to U.S. taxpayers. In fact, today we're joined here by the ISS National Lab and 20 of our U.S. commercial partner companies. The commercialization of low Earth orbit will enable NASA to focus resources to land the first woman and next man on the moon by 2024 as the first phase in creating a sustainable lunar presence to prepare for future missions to Mars. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Robin, can you tell us some more details about how NASA is going to make all of this possible? Absolutely. Thanks, Stephanie. As Jeff announced, NASA is rolling out its plan for commercial LEO development, which can be found on our new website that we're rolling out today. Last fall, NASA selected 12 companies to conduct studies to assess potential growth of a low Earth orbit economy and how to best stimulate private demand for commercial human spaceflight. We have representatives from these companies here with us today, as Jeff just mentioned. Key findings from the studies informed the plan that we'll be rolling out today. Uh, those include how commercial companies can make money in space by providing accommodations, facilities, in-space manufacturing, marketing, and more. Early on, NASA's use of and payment to destinations will be a key enabler for the emerging commercial market. The successful market will require a reduction in the cost of transportation to and from low Earth orbit. So now I'm going to describe the five parts of the plan uh, that we're rolling out today. First, we've released an International Space Station Commercial Use Policy. This policy provides an initial supply of NASA's station resources, including crew time, cargo launch and return, uh, for purchase by U.S. companies. This will enable expanded commercial and marketing activities to take place aboard the International Space Station that are beyond the scope of the ISS National Lab mandate, such as for profit manufacturing and marketing. Approved activities must have a connection to the NASA mission, will stimulate the low Earth orbit economy, or need the unique environment of microgravity. Second, as Jeff just mentioned, we're enabling private astronaut missions to the International Space Station. NASA will support up to two short duration private astronaut missions per year to the International Space Station beginning as early as 2020. These missions will be privately funded dedicated commercial space flights allowing approved commercial activities to be conducted on board the station. Private astronaut missions will use a U.S. spacecraft developed under NASA's commercial crew program. Our new commercial pol use policy 
will also cover pricing for private astronaut mission use of station resources, including life support systems, crew supplies, stowage, power, and data. Today, we posted a new NASA research announcement to apply for this opportunity. Third, we're making the forward port of the International Space Station's Node 2 Harmony module available for the first element of a future commercial destination. Responses from the commercial studies indicated a strong desire to use a space station docking port as an initial step toward eventual commercial habitable destinations in low Earth orbit. Companies will be able to demonstrate commercial activities and operations uh, while attached to this port on the station. A synopsis of the solicitation is released today. Uh, will be followed by a request for proposals on June 14th and NASA expects to award the port by the end of the fiscal year. In addition, NASA will be issuing a solicitation for a free-flying commercial destination to follow the docking port solicitation. Through this pair of solicitations, NASA will partner with industry to develop habitable low Earth orbit destinations that can one day meet NASA's needs as one of many customers. Fourth, we're seeking out opportunities to stimulate long-term sustainable demand. Without demand, we can't have a sustainable economy where NASA becomes one of many customers. Earlier this year, we released two NASA research announcements to focus on stimulating specific areas, such as in-space manufacturing, regenerative medicine, and other critical research areas that derive unique benefits from the microgravity environment, and creating laboratory concepts similar to capabilities found in terrestrial labs. Uh, white papers for this are due June 15th, uh, with proposals due ju July 28th. And just today, we released a synopsis for an Appendix J to the next, next Space Technologies for Exploration Partnerships, Next Step, broad area announcement to request proposals from U.S. entities with a focus on approaches to reducing transportation costs to and from low Earth orbit destinations, Understanding the transportation-driven price elasticity on demand for existing and potential low Earth orbit commercial markets. Opportunities to broaden the base of industry, academia, and government researchers seeking to use low Earth orbit capabilities. And we'll consider other proposals that identify innovative opportunities to foster long-term market growth. Lastly, we published a white paper defining NASA's minimum long-term requirements for low Earth orbit. NASA is providing this forecast so commercial destination providers can make business case assessments with greater knowledge about services that NASA intends to purchase as one of many customers. NASA's ongoing needs in low Earth orbit are expected to include crew accommodation for training and research, human research, biological and physical sciences research, technology demonstration and test beds, hosted science instruments, and an ongoing national laboratory capability for non-NASA government, academic, and commercial incubation use. So I've described our five-part plan at a pretty high level here. Uh, for a lot more information on all these opportunities, please visit our new website. And in addition, we're requesting feedback on our plan via a request for information also found on the website. Thank you. Did you catch all that? <laughs> it's good stuff. So uh, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, Bill, now we'll go to you. Uh, hopefully you can share your perspective of all of this. Right. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm really excited uh, to be here today and think about all the possibilities that this plan can bring. It's really fitting we're here at NASDAQ to talk about this. Because I think we need to think of a different way of doing business and the way we can use commercial low Earth orbit. I mean, you're all from kind of the space industry. You do things with us all the time. But, but how could we ever imagine that this space station would have any role when it was originally designed and put in space to have any role in developing new business markets? But today, you're part of that activity as we think about how this space station we put together to do research to do education, to do outreach, to do development, is now going to be used to help put together a business plan and business model. So this is an exciting day for all of us today. 
More than 50 companies are already conducting uh, commercial research and development on the space station via the International Space Station U.S. National Laboratory, and their results are yielding great promise. In addition, NASA has worked with 11 different companies to install 14 commercial facilities on the space station that support research and development projects for NASA and the, and the ISS National Lab. Many of the, these companies are represented here today. We have no idea what kinds of creativity and literally out-of-the-world ideas can come from private industry. We've tried to define many of the key parameters necessary for a company to build a business plan. However, the market and services that can be used to generate revenue will need to be generated by the creative and entrepreneurial private sector. We've given you the basic roadmap. Robin's laid out all the five components that we've got together. We've got all the pieces, but it's now up to you to use your creativity, your ingenuity, and figure out how you can generate potentially revenue from these, these pieces. We'll work together with you as Robin described. We don't have it perfect the first time around. We'll receive comments back from you and we'll figure out a way to keep moving forward. This plan does not conflict with the government needs for the space station nor the Center for Advancement of Science in Space, CASIS, that manages the ISS National Lab, but it allows the private sector access to the most amazing research facility ever built by humankind. So you can use this facility to generate revenue for yourselves. This is a huge different way for us doing business. NASA's activities we have described today stimulate and enable the next step in development of an emerging market, and we expect to learn and make adjustments. The private sector will have the opportunity to think creatively and create new markets. NASA's approach is designed to lower but not totally remove the risk from the private sector entrepreneurs and companies. NASA goal, NASA's goal is ultimately to be one of many users in the next generation of low Earth orbit research facilities. NASA is allowing the private sector access to the International Space Station to enable the next generation of low Earth orbit research facilities. NASA, by its very nature, is an exploration agency. We like to challenge the status quo and discover new things. We like to solve impossible problems and do amazing things. NASA only realizes that, that we need help. NASA realizes that we need help. We can't do this alone. We need everyone to help us moving forward. We need the pri we're reaching out to the U.S. private sector to see if you can push the economic frontier into space. This is a shift for NASA that will be beneficial for the American economy and for the American citizens. The commercialization of low Earth orbit will enable NASA to focus resources to land the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024 as the first phase in creating a sustainable lunar presence and preparing for missions to Mars. We are moving human presence into the solar system and U.S. private sector will be a part of that endeavor. We welcome the private sector and business sectors to our team. Thank you especially to all of you for coming here today to be part of this activity. Christine Koch, one of our crew members currently working on the International Space Station, will now share some of her thoughts from space. Hi, I'm astronaut Christina Koch. Those of us who have had the privilege to live and work aboard the International Space Station over the last 20 years know what an incredible experience it is and the unique value of the microgravity environment for research, development, and technology advancement. We are so excited to be part of NASA as our home and laboratory in space transitions into being accessible to expanded commercial and marketing opportunities, as well as to private astronauts. Enabling a vibrant economy in low Earth orbit has always been a driving element of the space station program and will make space more accessible to all Americans. Transitioning toward this new model of business is an important step to enable NASA to move full speed ahead toward our goal of landing the first woman and the next man on the moon. Commercial companies will play an important role both here in low Earth orbit and around the moon, working with NASA to test technologies, train astronauts, and develop a sustainable human presence. We're sure you have questions now. There's a lot of information to take in. Uh, we will take questions. We'll start in the room for reporters. Uh, please raise your hand. There should be a microphone. Um, let's see. 
Do we have somebody who can run the microphone around? Um, and then uh, for reporters who are dialed in on the line, please make sure that you dial star one on your phone to get into the queue to ask a question. In the room, raise your hand. Please state your name and affiliation and to whom you're directing your question. Please ask only one question so everybody will have an opportunity. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started with Lauren. Thank you, Lauren Grush with The Verge. Thanks for taking my question. So I'd really love some clarification about what was prohibited before this announcement and what is exactly changing and what is the legislation that is in place for it, or was any legislation needed in order for this change to take place? Thank you. Robin, that's probably you. Probably yeah. Gerst or Robin. I'll take, Robin, you, yeah. I'll take a few. Yeah. yeah, so what... What is changing is uh, before we've had the ISS National Laboratory um, that operates uh, and brings in and stimulates demand for low Earth orbit. And uh, they're focused on and their mandate is for research and development activities, um, but not for uh, if, a, if a manufacturing uh, effort turns into a for-profit activity or activities like marketing and advertising, uh, that's, that's beyond the mandate. So we wanted to open that up for commercial companies to, uh, to participate in those kinds of activities. No legislative change was required to do that. It's simply a policy change on NASA's part. So that's the NASA interim directive. If you look for that, that outlines what is now enabled and prohibited. Mm -hmm. So this was always an option that you could have had. It's just a policy change within NASA. And I think the other thing that's important is we've actually defined it. So you can go out and look at this, and you can see exactly what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, there's certain things. If the, if the uh, private astronaut goes to station, the, the breadth of activities they can participate in is much broader. They can do more activities. I mean, it also clarifies some of the roles of NASA. So what we try to do is remove some of the ambiguity that sat out there before with the legislation authority we had, try to define it in a way that we think is forward-leaning and lets companies then take an advantage and generate some revenue in space. So again, we, we open this up. This is the beginning. We can get some iteration. We look for some comments back. If it's still too restrictive from a commercial perspective, that's, co that's comments that come back to us, and then we could go pursue legislation. So this is the beginning of us actively starting an open dialogue with industry to figure out how we can open up space to the commercial activities where revenue can be generated for private sector companies. And that's a very different way. So we, we leverage off of what we've got. We know it may not be sufficient, but it's defined. People can see it. They can represent and ask questions to us, and we can change and move forward. So this is going to be a growing and learning experience for both of us. If I can tell us one more thing, which is we didn't need any policy change um, but we did have some teams, Doug Comstock and his group went, we met with our key stakeholders up on the Hill in the House of Senate and uh, with OMB and the response that we've been getting from our key stakeholders uh, is very positive towards this move. And it's an allocation as well. So NASA is setting aside 5% of NASA's resources on the station to enable these activities. Okay, next question. Hi, uh, Miriam Kramer with Axios. Uh, so I'm sort of curious, I know that this is just the beginning, but when you're looking to, you know, maybe 10 years out or nine years out, uh, what does the space station look like at that point? Is it, are, are we just having private astronauts there? What, what's, what's the deal with the space station? I mean, there's a couple of views, but I think, you know, eventually the space station we have, the, the International Space Station will wear out, the physical hardware won't be able to be maintained. It'll become cost prohibitive for us to keep us operating. So the vision here is to start early. So then there could be potentially a private sector station that serves NASA's needs. So the, the fifth point that Robin talked about is what we envision as NASA's future needs. So we can say in the future, we intend to buy these kind of services, these kind of things are, are things that we want to do. Then if that marries with what a private sector space station would like to do for their own revenue generating things, we can show them what our portion of the market is. So I think what we're doing is we're trying to be proactive. We recognize there's a physical end to the space station just because of its life. Now is the time to start proactively having those discussions because we know it'll take time for the private sector to come up to go see how this comes together and moves forward. So that's the intent of what we're trying to do. Great, next question. Michael Sheets with CNBC. Two questions on the private astronaut aspect of this. Uh, first, 
have you, how many astronauts per year would you expect to fly underneath this proposal? And second, uh, will these astronauts be facilitated through NASA or will NASA just be giving the okay to the private companies to sell seats on their rides? So we're enabling up to two uh, commercial uh, flights with private astronauts per year. So depending on how many seats they want to carry, that would be you know, a dozen or so private astronauts potentially per year on the International Space Station. Uh, second part of your question? The second part is as far as the facilitation of, will yeah. NASA be the one selling those seats or? No. Okay. We're looking to the private sector to do that. And so again, what we did was we developed the commercial crew program to take our astronauts to station, but that program was was designed to begin with that anyone could go buy those transportation services. So we're looking to the private sector to do the training, to do the transportation, to work out the accommodations, to be the interface between the, the individuals that want to fly, the, the private astronauts, and, and us. So, and so we expect this private sector companies to go do all that work. And, and we think we put all the pieces in place that enable them to go, go work. But that's a lot of work for them to do. There's a lot of companies, a lot of interfaces they got to put together. It's not trivial for them to go out and just make a, an arrangement to fly someone. They're going to have to work with a myriad of companies to figure out how to make it happen. But that's part of this challenge that we've given to them to see if the private sector can step up and put all that together to enable this. But we've, we've enabled the facility. We've defined what use can be done. We've tried to provide the parameters such that the private sector then can take those parameters, put it together, and work up a business case. And on that first question about the demand side of things, have those private companies given you a good forecast on that that's a good place to start with two a year and then maybe you know scale from there as far as, because these are not cheap rides. They're multiple tens of millions of dollars each ride. We're going to uh, reevaluate the pricing every six months is what we have written in right now, and you'll see that on the, on the website. Um, and you're, you're absolutely correct about the cost. So um, NASA will be involved in the fact that if a private astronaut is on station, they will have to pay us while they're there for the life support, the food, the water, um, things of that nature. Um, the ride to get there, as you know right now, we pay about $80 million a seat for our own astronauts to go. Um, if you average out the commercial crew program, our cost is coming down to about $58 million a seat. So theoretically, a private astronaut, I would expect the price to be in that range. They'd have to, you know, the two companies right now that can do it are Boeing and SpaceX. And so they would have to contract with them and whatever price is Boeing and SpaceX set uh, is on them, but then when they get to station, there will be a cost uh, for station. And I, you know, it's back, it, it, it's sort of, it's not, if you look at the pricing and you add it up back of the napkin, it would be roughly about $35,000 a night per astronaut, um, but it won't come with any Hilton or Marriott points. <laughs> okay, do we have other questions in the room from reporters? Uh, there's the hand over there. Hi, uh, Hanukkah Weidering with space.com. I'm wondering if the private astronauts will be trained to do spacewalks to do like repairs and maintenance outside of the station. We, we don't envision that initially. Um, we've de you can go pull the policy and you can take a look and see what we've defined, but we don't see that as a capability. And, and again, kind of going back to the other question a little bit, through the studies, we saw that this private astronaut was one of the things that there was a lot of interest from the companies that participated in the studies. If you read the studies, there's lots of variability about whether this is viable or not viable. There's speculation of how many numbers they are. So, so then again, this is our chance to actually test and see what's available in the market. But initially, no spacewalk. Our, our own astronauts will still be there, manning the station, doing all the external repairs. Um, this is an opportunity for private astronauts to be inside station doing their own research and, and development. And it's really a first step. You know, we can offer this now before a company potentially puts a, a private module on the space station or flies a free flyer. <laughs> so it's, a, uh, it's kind of a crawl before you walk approach and uh, gives companies an opportunity to, um, to fly using the resources we have today. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here in the room. Right by you, Mary Beth. Yep. Hi, uh, Ken Chang, New York Times. Um, the idea of, of commercial module on ISS dates back to the uh, previous administrator and the previous administration. Um, so I was wondering what's being announced today. Is that just a fruition of those early efforts? Have it, has it changed yet? And conversely, was there um, resistance within NASA 
that partially explains why it's taken three years for this to be announced. I think what we're doing today is, is we thought it was important to describe the entire commercial market the way we see it. So not just focus on just the, the attachment of a module to station through a port or focus on just a free flyer or focus just on private astronaut missions or focus on what NASA's future needs are. We thought it was best if we could take the entire commercial front as we see it from a NASA perspective. And this is what we saw from the studies and we're responding to the studies, if we could put all that out at one time and then let the private sector see which areas they're interested in, where their niche is, where they think there's a market potential, and then let them go pursue on their own. So we thought it was important, instead of doing this kind of piecemeal, one at a time, and, and dropping these various pieces, it was good to put it all together. It took us a little bit of time to get all that together, but it was actually informed by the studies. We are trying to respond to the breadth of the, the activities that the studies said were potentials for revenue generation. We're trying to be responsive to industry. So we actually put some things in we hadn't been working on based on what we saw in the studies and we put that out. So this is a chance for everyone to see kind of where we see right now the total perspective for commercialization of low Earth orbit. Any other questions in the room from reporters? Okay, uh, we'll go to some questions on the phone. Uh, I believe we may have some questions already in the queue. So, operator, if you will open the phone line for the first question, and we'll take that. Our first question over the phones is from Chris Davenport. Your line is open. Hi, thanks, guys. Um, a question about the revenue this generates. Do you have any forecast for how much additional revenue the uh, commercial opportunities will bring, the private uh, astronauts, would bring, and uh, would that additional revenue be used to for Artemis, the Artemis program? Thanks. We do anticipate um, that the revenue that's generated from these activities will reduce our cost to, to operate the International Space Station, uh, and that then that revenue can shift and help us in our, our mission to get to the moon uh, and the Artemis program by 2024. So we do anticipate that revenue going to support that effort, yes. But that was the question. We also see well, that and how much we also see the fact that if there's now use beyond NASA's use for say transportation, and there's now a bigger demand for transportation for both crew and cargo access to, to low Earth orbit, then NASA can now participate with this larger market and we don't have to carry the cost of each and every launch cost. So the fact that the market is expanding and there's now some breadth, we think we're gonna gain some advantage from that where we're, we're really, we talk about it as we're one now of many customers where there's now uses for these things that used to be dedicated solely to NASA. They're now used for some private sector activities and NASA can then participate in that. And we see that as a benefit to us that then lowers the amount that we have to spend on keeping our astronauts trained or using low earth orbit for our own purposes. The, the, other, the other thing to add to that is, is one of our, our goals is uh, to grow a very robust space economy, which is good for, for all Americans. And so uh, by doing this and allowing these activities and allowing companies to grow, and if you look at NASA Home, you'll see the thousands of products already in the marketplace uh, that have driven billions of dollars from therapeutic mattresses, everything else, to, uh, uh, that have come from what we've developed in space, tube toothpaste, air filtration, water filtration, There's so many products out there that now drive our economy that have come from NASA. And so it's another way to enable the commercial sector uh, to keep doing that work. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, operator. Our next question is from Irene Klotz. Your line is open. Um, thanks very much. Wanted to take another crack at Chris's question of the station's $300 billion a year estimated annual expenses, and I understand this is a forecast. Um, how much do you expect to be able to reduce that, say, in 2022 or pick whatever year you're using in your projections? And also, how long under this um, under this plan, do you think ISS will be in orbit? And businesses obviously like to know how long they're, um, they have to recoup investments. So are you looking at 2028 under this plan or, or what? Thank you. Again, this is the rollout. And we have 20 U.S. companies here. And there are already 50 U.S. companies that do experiments on the space station. So 
Um, it's hard to project what's going to come back. What we're hearing is, is a lot of excitement in the commercial uh, sector for this. But it's hard to get accurate projections until six or 12 months from now when we see what actually comes back in and, and who partners with us. And again, at, if the demand is very, very strong, we'll adjust the pricing upward accordingly. And right now, this is the rollout and trying to spur that, that excitement and spur that investment from, from commercial partners. And so it's really hard to get, get good projections right now, but ask us in a year, and I think we'll have, uh, we'll have good numbers on that. As far as the future of Space Station, we, NASA provided a Space Station transition plan last year. And in that plan, we outlined principles for ISS transition. And the main principle in that is there will be no gap in human spaceflight in low Earth orbit. So our, 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 by rolling out this new policy and enabling these new capabilities, we're hoping that new capabilities can develop that can one day take over uh, uh, for the space station. And we will begin to do that transition when those capabilities become available. But not in, we won't transition off station until we have something else to go to. So we don't have a date certain, but we're trying to, to enable these new capabilities so that we can do that transition in a seamless manner. And, and on that note, think about it. We've had people working and living in space for 18 years now. So high school seniors graduating that just graduated high school have never known a world where there haven't been astronauts in space continuously. Their entire lives, we've had astronauts on, space, uh, on station. So um, this is just the next progression in allowing that, the economy to take over and grow it even further. I think the other thing we ought to all keep in mind is, you know, economic market development takes a long time. Transitions take a long time. This is the very beginning, and we want to make sure that we started as early as we could to see where we are moving forward. I think it would be premature to start making projections on what we're going to save, how things fit right now. We need to experiment. We need to see what's happening. We need to make changes. We need to adapt and move forward. And we need to recognize it's going to take a little bit of time for this stuff to happen. So this is not going to be... It's NASA today, it's all the commercial sector tomorrow. This is going to be a nice transition period between us. But, it, but this allows NASA to stay focused on the longer-term things, going back to the moon, pushing human presence deeper into space. It's showing that NASA is willing to let go and see if the private sector over time can take over low Earth orbit, and that's our vision moving forward. Thanks. And does the prohibition on marketing and advertising stay in place? Sorry, Irene, can you repeat that? What was it about commercial marketing and advertising? Uh, does the prohibition on advertising and marketing on ISS stay in place? Uh, the uh, NASA interim directive addresses the uh, commercial and marketing opportunities. And Robin, do you want to describe that more in detail about uh, what U.S. government astronauts will be allowed to do for commercial and marketing activities and what private astronauts will be allowed to do? Right. The, as Stephanie said, in the interim directive, you can see there's actually a nice chart that, that shows what activities will be allowed for a uh, U.S. crew to participate in and, and then what they're not allowed to participate in but what private astronauts can participate in. So U.S. astronauts will be able to participate in some marketing activities if they're sort of behind the camera activities um, for those things that are beyond that scope. Private astronauts uh, can definitely do those activities, but that's all laid out in the directive uh, online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irene. Uh, we'll take the next question from the phone. Our next question is from Jeff Faust. Your line is open. Good morning. I wanted to ask if the uh, new ISS commercial use policy addresses some of the other impediments that have been previously uh, brought up about commercial use of the ISS, notably intellectual property rights. Is that being addressed here, or is that going to have to wait for the future? Thanks. Did you catch that? Yeah, the, the question, I think, was about intellectual property rights. Um, again, I think it defines what our current understanding is of intellectual property rights. There's been discussion back and forth. We think there's enough protection there, but again, we'll get some comments back. We've seen comments before. If we require legislation to protect in a more real sense for these companies, I think it's a different uh, case than we've had before. In this case, the majority of the investment and in the activity is coming from the private sector. So therefore, we think it's reasonable that they own intellectual property and they maintain that. 
we'll get the clarity. You can see it in the document. You can see where it sits, and we'll figure out if it's gone far enough or we need to do more. And if we do, we'll pursue legislation. Okay, well, next question on the line. Next question is from Daniel Overhouse. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking that question. Um, in 1982, NASA had commissioned a study about how uh, companies might put a space station to commercial use. Um, and obviously, the kind of commercial goals for a station have fallen short in the last 20 years as the OIG acknowledged itself in a report last year. So I was curious to know, um, aside from the $40 million earmarked for commercial LEO development, um, what has changed, do you think, to allow this plan to be successful this time around? And can you kind of explain how that $40 million will factor into this program? So I think what's really changed is we're, we had the ability and we put in place the commercial cargo and commercial crew programs. Those programs were designed from the beginning that – NASA did not own the spacecraft to take crews from the surface of the Earth to station. We decided that that would be owned by the companies that did that work. So that's enabled now, and we actually worked with the uh, FAA to make sure that the licensing for those flights was handled by the FAA and it didn't involve NASA. So from the very beginning, we enabled a key piece of operating in space, the transportation and taking supplies to space to be done by private industry. That's a big change. So then that allows them to be in control of their destiny, at least in terms of transportation to and from. The other thing that we heard loud and clear in the studies is we needed to define the criteria of what they could do in space, how they could do things in space, and what opportunities were coming forward. We put all that out in the five points that Robin described earlier. They can be seen. So we're trying to knock down all the barriers that have been around for a while and see what the private sector can do to construct a business plan and construct a revenue stream out of these pieces. So I think the big things that have changed is now the private sector has the ability to control large portions of their own destiny, be in control of things, and understand the environment and their relationship with NASA. In terms of the $40 million, we're going to look at a variety of things for that where it makes sense. It could be things like helping the demand side because we think there may be some more product development, some more research that has potentially commercial uh, posture for that. So we'll spend some fun money there. We'll spend a little bit of money maybe helping things moving forward, but it's not pure commercialization. It's about how we can effectively enable this uh, infrastructure moving forward. And we'll see when we get proposals back to our various solicitations what companies are requesting from NASA. Is it money? Is it expertise? Is it the port? You know, what kinds of resources does NASA have that will help enable these new capabilities? So we'll go off of those proposal requests as well. But. As, as Bill said, we will split the money uh, between both what we call the supply side and the demand side because we want to stimulate demand as well as uh, these new capabilities. Uh, I think also what has changed is our, our community has grown up uh, on station. We have so many implementation partners and commercial partners now who have matured and are now bringing in their own customers uh, in the room here today. Um, that I think it's the, the time is right to take the next step and, and, and we'll be successful. I mean, that, that's another point. Even in my opening remarks, I talked about the companies that are present here that have commercial facilities on station. The other thing we've learned is we can also take some facilities from the ground and take them to station and they work fine. So we have some research instruments, some medical research instruments that are essentially the same version as terrestrially on the ground and they're on station operating today. So I think we've shown that you don't have to build custom research equipment, custom act to actually get results from space. So I think we've, we've removed some of the uncertainty associated with space research, and we've shown that commercial activities can be operated in, in space today. You know, one side note to that, too, is for us to get to the moon and to get to Mars, get back to the moon and get to Mars, there are still some key technologies that we need our commercial partners uh, to help us figure out. There's some things that need to some technologies we still need to, to derive to make that happen. And so I'm hoping in some of these, these proposals that come back, we even get some, some of those that come in from our commercial partners that are here. Thank you. Uh, next question on the phone. Our next question is from Tim Fernholz. Your line is open. Hello, good morning. Uh, I wanted to ask, since this does seem to depend on commercial crew 
and on having two functioning commercial crew vehicles. Can you give us an update on the status of those programs? And I also wanted to ask if there's any opportunity costs for NASA diverting these resources to be available to private companies. So in terms of the status of the commercial crew program, as you know, SpaceX has flown their uncrewed uh, test flight to space station. Um, we're in the process now for them. The next thing from them will, for, from SpaceX will be an in-flight abort test. Um, that's coming up next. On the Boeing case, there's going to be a, a pad abort test that needs to occur. Um, and also they need to do an uncrewed demonstration flight. For the Boeing side, there's no relationship between the pad abort test and the uncrewed demonstration to the station. They can occur whenever they're ready to occur. Um, we're planning, I think, on the Boeing case for both of those in the August time frame. So we expect to see the first uh, crewed test flight to station probably by the end of this year, by the end of 2019. Then that sets us up for that earliest possible date for the private astronaut mission sometime in the 2020 time frame. So that's where we stand. And you'll be able to conduct those with just one operator if the space station crew dragon anomaly is not resolved at that time? I think we've got enough capability. Again, it's up to the private sector to see what's available, but I think there's probably enough capability that if only one provider is available in 2020, we can still support the, the kind of um, uh, flights that, that Robin talked about earlier, the two flights per year. It, you also ask about opportunity costs. I think it's careful that we don't focus so much on our, our lost opportunities. We're able to still protect what we need to do for the for the CASIS activities on board station. We still can protect for the national lab. We can still protect for the re research that we need to do for NASA's needs. And this is some surplus capability that we're making available. And yes, we're giving up some surplus capability, and that is a loss to NASA. But I think we shouldn't focus on what that loss is to NASA, but we look at the gain. If we can now have a private sector where we can go acquire services, that's a huge plus from us from a NASA standpoint. So it's worth a little bit of, of loss and research for our own, or our own purposes in these short-term, near-term uh, cases. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question on the phone line. Our next question is from Alan Boyle. Your line is open. Hi, uh, thank you for taking the question. Uh, from what Robin was saying, it sounds as if uh, they, there's not a date certain for completing the transition to full commercial operations. I know at one point there was talk about pending direct support for the space station by 2025. Is that date not operable, or, or are you still thinking about trying to make the transition by that date? And after that date, who would receive the payment? If NASA is going to be the customer, who is going to be the vendor? Thank you. You know, that, that date was a, is a proposal, and the Hill has, has looked at other dates, and there's, right now, there's no real firm date on when that can happen, but that starts with, any of those dates starts with this right now, which is inviting our commercial partners uh, to come aboard and start doing their activities. So this is, this is the first step, and again, in a year or two, we can have much clearer picture of, of when a transition can happen, and, and, and what dates can be available. All the dates you've seen right now are just proposals and in, in, in basically trying to set a date to spur this activity that's happening right now. As far as who, who's the vendor going to be, I think uh, someone in this room could be the vendor or multiple entities in this room could be the vendor. Uh, that's that's uh, what, what, why we're rolling out this, uh, this plan and we're looking forward to uh, partnering with our commercial providers and trying to enable as many capabilities as we possibly can. Thank you, Tim. Uh, next question on the phone. Our next question is from Robert Parlon. Your line is open. Hi. Um, thinking back uh, uh, about the history of the space station and NASA's activities on board, that could sort of fall under marketing. In the past, that's, all, that's sort of fallen under educational outreach in terms of working with, like, Disney or Lego or upwards and movies for studios. So will NASA now step back from those types of activities so it's not to undercut uh, a commercial opportunity? Or is there any type of conflict there? Again, I think you bring up a very interesting point, like the education activities, the outreach stuff that we've done with Lego and others on board station. 
Um, I think we need to see what comes forward in these proposals, see what happens, see if the private sector is stepping up. I mean, we still have the, the, uh, the need to do education and outreach to inspire the next generation, to help students get inspired for science, technology, engineering, and math. We'll see if the private sector steps up and if there's enough there. But what we've got to be careful of is we don't want to compete with the private sector. So we've got to figure out a way that we're not creating an, another path to station that undermines what they're trying to do. So we're going to have to, to balance and learn and figure out how to go do this moving forward. So I can't give you a cut and dried answer exactly how that happens. We'll see what we get into proposals. I think we have a clear desire for education outreach. We have a clear desire to use station to continue to do the public you know, pur purposes that it's doing today. How much of the private sector picks that up, we'll see through the proposals. If we still need to do some, we'll do that in a manner that doesn't undercut what we're trying to do with the private sector. I would, I would say very much the feeling at NASA is that that is not an either or trade off, but actually the, edu the educational outreach opportunities will grow with this program. I, I see it spurring that. I don't see that as a trade off at all. I think this is, this is an add on. I believe we have one more question on the phone line. Our next question is Keith Howing. Your line is open. Hi, a question for Bill Gerstemeyer. First of all, it, I'm glad to see that NASA is finally taking uh, space station commercialization seriously. You and I both sat through meetings about this 20, 30 years ago at NASA, so it must be kind of nice for you to finally be able to you know, talk about this. Uh, my question, CASIS is wholly funded by NASA. They get $15 million a year, and to a great extent, they give away free flights to the space station for research. But this new effort that you're announcing charges for access. So isn't NASA competing with itself? Isn't this another path? And I, I'm going to answer my own question here because Cases just tweeted something where they're bragging about the fact that 55% of their research is privately funded. So how does this work? Is, do these new labs come up with a 50% allocation for Cases and 50% for NASA? Do the international partners get an allocation on this? I mean, is this really competition or is this something totally different where cases is sort of put aside in one way and the commercial stuff is put in another way and it, it, it never do the two paths meet? Again, I think you can take a look at the details that are out on the website. It shows you how much is available for this activity. It shows you where the cases portion of the National Lab sits. And again, I think we've, I think Jeff described it extremely well. We need to look at this where it's not a trade-off, right? How do we do all of these things, right? If we, if we all focus on just one path and one way of doing research and, and output, I don't think it's as rich as if we get a chance to look at it doing uh, multiple different ways. So we'll get a chance to see how this works moving forward. We still need to keep the CASIS activities in place and their resources and their use of station is still protected. The private sector will know what that is. It's defined in our documentation. What's available for them to use on their own purposes is available. It's clear. They can see where it is, and we'll find out later if that's the right mix. But again, I think it's this is the whole of, of how we can move forward. I think if we try to bucket in, in individual pieces, we then end up splitting the thing up so we can't really make effective movement forward. But again, I think we need to keep an open mind. We need to look at this as we move forward and see what we can learn as we, as we go do this activity. We're going to be working very closely with CASIS and expanding on what they do through the ISS National Lab. But as I explained earlier, there are certain things that they are limited in doing. They can't, we can't subsidize for-profit activities. We can't subsidize advertising activities. So there's things that, that CASIS under the National Lab is not mandated to do. And that, those are the areas that we're expanding on and trying to offer new opportunities here. Uh, so we'll be having to work closely with CASIS, but they're still a vital part uh, of building demand and incubating these new research ideas through the National Lab. Once they kind of cross that threshold from incubation into production, per, per se, that's where this new policy uh, helps out and allows for those activities. And again, Keith, CASIS will still do what they do, uh, and this is taking a portion of the excess capacity out of NASA's side to allow for-profit ventures on NASA's side. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the big change, but it doesn't affect what CASIS is already doing. Thank you. Uh, I believe we have some questions that people have submitted using the Ask NASA hashtag as well. So we'll now go to those questions. So we have um, Trisha asking um, from social media, hi NASA, 
what, uh, where do space marketing agencies submit commercial proposals to NASA for marketing partnerships aboard the ISS? It's through, through our new website, right? <laughs> uh, um, Tricia can, can look on the new website and find a link there to uh, submit those proposals and, uh, and ask for the resources that we're uh, carving out through this new policy. And the, the NASA news release that we issued includes a breakout with hyperlinks to all the relative, relevant uh, places to go. I believe it's what, nasa.gov forward slash Leo for low Earth orbit hyphen economy. And uh, another question from D Trapezoid. Uh, what metrics will you use for awarding a commercial bid to access the ISS for marketing and travel? Uh, highest bidder, what are you doing to ensure a fair market in this transition with regards to sustainability and social media tourism regulations maintaining core NASA missions? So I believe our policy is first come, first serve. Uh, any one entity is limited uh, to the amount of resources that we've allocated on, on a single purchase, and that's outlined in the policy. But they do have to meet one of three basic requirements, which uh, Robin mentioned in her opening remarks. A nexus to NASA's mission, a uh, unique need for microgravity, and show that uh, you can expand the commercial market. Next question. Next one uh, from Petra. Will NASA get to keep the revenue generated uh, from commercial operations? No. <laughs> we, don't, we don't keep any, you know, we're a government agency, we don't keep any revenue if you really look at it. But um, again, this, isn't, this is not going to be a profit-making venture for NASA at all, but it will defray some of our expenses. And, and the prices we're putting up there uh, are a portion of our expenses uh, to maintain stations. So just defray some of our expenses, which we then can use uh, to go further into space and get to Mars. And our last one from Jose. Uh, What's the legislative nature for private astronauts? Will it be restricted to U.S. citizens only? Um, I believe that that is yes, right? I'm looking at you, Christy. <laughs> um, so I'll 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 answer. Um, the uh, so for um, for us and our and our policy, we're restricting that to U.S. entities. Um, we will allow the, the commercial market to talk with whoever they need to on uh, private astronauts. So private, uh, private astronauts from other countries can fly through a U.S. entity. Correct. Yes. Great. Those are great questions. Thank you all for joining us in the room, on the phone, online. It's a very exciting day for us here at NASA. Uh, but that's all the time I think we have for our news conference this morning. NASDAQ is hosting additional NASA experts and representatives from the companies here today for a discussion that will air on its Facebook page beginning at 11.30 a.m. We hope you'll tune into that at facebook.com slash NASDAQ. And of course, we have lots of new material for you to read over the weekend, uh, available online at nasa.gov. Uh, you can read all the details and find links to the various open opportunities to conduct business at the International Space Station. Thank you.